Okay, so um, my name is Glenn Weil, and uh, you can call me Glenn, you can call me Professor Weil, you can call me by any nickname you come up with for me, or if um, you can't come up with a nickname, I can give you some nicknames that people have called me in the past. Uh, and the idea is that in this class, you know, we respect ideas, uh, not titles, and I hope you guys will all try to be my colleagues rather than just my students and really be engaged with and debate with me, correct with me, if I make mistakes, uh, jump in if you disagree with things that I say. This class is Price Theory and Market Design, uh, which is Econ 24210 slash 40501. It has as prereqs for undergraduates only, and if you had trouble registering for the class because of graduate prereqs and you're a graduate student, please tell me. Uh, but the, the prereqs really should only be for the undergraduates, and those are Econ 201 uh, and multivariate calculus and stat either two, 23400 or 24400. Um, we're going to try to use all of the skills that you learned in these various classes in this class, so please uh, be prepared to do that. The course um, unifies a few topics that are, I think, usually viewed separately. One is sort of price theory, which is, you know, roughly basic supply and demand thinking um, with uh, market design, which is a big uh, booming field of frontier economic research about how you should try to set up different markets. So today in class, I'm going to go first over some logistics and details about the nature of the course that you're diving into. Uh, second is we'll talk about some substantive things, so in particular the Friedman article I asked you to read and some issues about philosophy of science. And then at the end I'll go through a summary of what we're going to cover in the rest of the course. Okay, so this is a bit of an unusual course along several dimensions. So one is that it's an undergraduate graduate joint course. Um, and it is joint because on the one hand it doesn't use math um, or sort of specialized economic skills at the level you would usually expect in a graduate course. But I would argue that in some ways it's actually harder than most graduate courses because it demands a lot in terms of creative economic thinking. And that way it'll be sort of similar to, uh, for the graduate students, the Becker-Murphy price theory course. Um, for undergraduates, it may be different from other classes because, first of all, I'm going to start cold calling on people uh, starting today, so be prepared for that. Um, I'm going to force you in problem sets to learn uh, some of the concepts in the course by exploration and actually figuring them out yourself rather than um, just uh, hearing me tell them to you. Uh, and anyone, I think actually a large fraction of the undergrads who are taking this class uh, were in or know someone who was in my 201 class last year, and you can get a sense from them about like the style of my classes. Um, the problem sets in this class are going to be very long and very hard and somewhat open-ended and require creative economic thinking. Again, anyone who has experience with my problem sets from the past will know what I mean by that. Um, please don't spend forever on them, but do try to think through them and really engage with them and take something away that's valuable for thinking about economics from them rather than just trying to get through them. Um, scores in this class are almost certainly going to be lower perhaps than any course you've ever taken. Uh, maybe not for the graduate students, definitely for the undergraduates, but it's going to be curved extremely generously and separately for the graduate and undergraduates. So I would guess that the distribution in this class will be, in terms of grades, like 50% higher or something like that, whatever, in whatever metric space that stuff lies, uh, than, um, than it is for like a standard undergraduate course. Uh, even though, and I think, again, the people who took 201 last year can attest that while the course is very difficult and the numerical scores are very low, uh, the distribution of grades is actually pretty generous relative to a standard undergraduate course. Um, and finally, I want <coughs> you to come to my and the TA's office hours, and the TA's uh, want to see you there too. I don't think that um, Seth is here. He's going to be the TA for this course. 
but, uh, but we're very enthusiastic for you guys to really engage with, econo um, with uh, us about economics. That's the reason why we make the course so challenging. So we really want to get you guys thinking about economics, economic research, et cetera. Okay. So I'm also going to be teaching a section of Econ 201, actually 201.10, uh, this term. And this is going to be something of a little sister course for this course. It's going to cover somewhat similar material at a lower level. And in fact, their problem sets are sort of going to be riffs off of your problem set. Um, so this will make it useful to maybe look at their problem sets when you're reviewing for the exams for this class. Um, and also, if you have trouble following a class uh, here, you could try going to their class, which meets directly before this at 1.30, uh, the same days. There's also a large bank of old problem sets and exams that will provide plenty of material for you to uh, help you study. And all lectures for the course are going to be online on my YouTube uh, page, which is Prof. Glenn Weil. Um, Stieg, where's Stieg? Ah, uh, Stieg. Uh, is, I guess, I don't know whether Steve's going to be videotaping or whether uh, this gentleman from uh, Media Services is going to be videotaping, but uh, Steve manages the website and will keep all the stuff up to date. So if it's not up to date, you can attack him, um, throw rotten tomatoes at him. Um, okay, so the course website and readings are on chalk. Um, and uh, some of the material is available on my website, stuff that doesn't need to be gated. Um, required uh, readings and additional references are in the syllabus. I think that should keep you pretty busy. Uh, putting those two together, you get a lot of reading, but if anyone is bored and wants more reading, uh, uh, the people who were in my 201 class last year know that I have like a 20-page long monstrosity of additional readings that uh, are related to the lectures. Um, there's no textbook for this class, but we will use some of the lectures from Gary Becker's Economic Theory book. Um, and so that's probably a good book to have. Um, all other readings are going to be on the website. Um, and some references uh, will be on reserve in the library rather than on the website because they come out of books. Um, you can reach me at this. Uh, my office hours are Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. in Rosenwald 205. Notice that you're going to have to miss half of office hours because of the section timing. Um, that was deliberate so that there would be one hour that would be just reserved for the overwhelmingly undergraduates who are in the other course. But if you can't make this one hour of office hours that's left for you guys, uh, let me know. And I'm happy to meet with you outside. Uh, in fact, I'd really like to get to know you guys. The section leader is Seth Blumberg, whose contact information is here. And his section will be uh, Monday, 4 to 5 in Stewart, 102. His office hours, sorry, if it's Mon it's Wednesday. It must be Wednesday, 4 to 5. Yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made this comment. OK, so the Stewart, it's, it's Wednesday, 4 to 5 in this room. Um, and uh, office hours are 2 to 3 on Tuesdays, that is uh, just before uh, this class and during the, um, uh, the undergrad class. OK, uh, the intermediate class. So the graded requirements for this course are, um, first, participation. And I will sort of grade based on the cold calls. Um, second, six problem sets that will be due at the beginnings of lectures throughout the course. Uh, two of those problem sets are already posted. The third one will probably be posted by the end of this week. Um, please work together uh, on these problem sets, but list the people that you worked with so we can make sure that you're not just completely copying each other. Um, and if we do find that you're completely copying each other and don't list it, then you'll be in even bigger trouble. Uh, third, uh, there's a take-home midterm, which is on the weekend of November 3rd to 4th. This exam is open everything, but do not collaborate with anyone on this exam. The exam is going to be very challenging, and we will be able to tell if you collaborated because you will almost certainly get the same wrong answer as someone else. Uh, so uh, please, please do not collaborate on these exams. 
Uh, they're, they're hard enough so that it's very easy to identify cheating on them. Um, okay, uh, the take home final uh, will be on the weekend of December 8th to 9th. Um, and uh, there will be a 10, about 10 page proposal for a research paper due December 14th. Now grading difference between undergrad and grad, graduate students have to do both the final and the proposal, whereas undergraduates, um, and this is the split of uh, credit for the different things, undergraduates can choose one or the other of the final or the proposal, or if they want, they can do both and either register as being a graduate student, uh, if they want to just do both, or they can register as an undergrad and then choose one of the two for whichever gives them a better grade. Um, there will be a generous curve for the class, which will be separate for both grad and undergrads. Um, and uh, that is, is that. Okay. So now I want to start getting into the substance of the things that I wanted to talk about today. So, so I wanted to sort of like start off the class by giving you an example of how powerful I've found economic analysis to be for me in thinking about the world. And one of the books that had the biggest influence on how I think was by uh, University of Chicago economist Milton Friedman, uh, Capitalism and Freedom. I don't, how many people in this room had read Capitalism and Freedom previous to this course? Raise your hand. Not very many. Wow, that's amazing. It's an it's a amazing book. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. And I think that the chapter that I assigned you guys is sort of economic analysis at its best. Because what it does is it takes something which there's conventional wisdom uh, about, you know, that uh, doctors should be licensed, and then it tries to look at that from an economic perspective and really turn it on its, uh, on its head in, a, I think, a pretty per, uh, persuasive way. So um, it skillfully, but informally, without using any mathematics, uses all the sorts of tools and concepts that we're going to uh, learn throughout this course. Um, and uh, this is, I hope, the type of reasoning that you'll learn to do over the course of this uh, class. So over the course of this class, you'll learn how to use some mathematics. You'll learn how to think about things in a research-oriented way, interact with data a little bit. But in the end, um, what we're interested in as economists is making persuasive arguments about what public policy should be. Um, and often, we only end up gesturing at data when we do that uh, type of thing, and, uh, or only gesturing at formal arguments that we make. And so hopefully, you'll learn over the course of this class to persuasively use many different uh, skills to make uh, arguments about economic policy. OK, Mark Brown. Mark here? No? OK. Um, does anyone else want to briefly describe what Friedman's argument was in the, in the article that I had you guys read? Chrissy? Um, and he goes through different ways that the government can basically create barriers to entry mm -hmm. um, for different professionals. Yeah. And then he takes the most compelling argument, basically doctors, yeah. for reasons that we would agree with him. And he says, even in that case, it's better to let it be. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what Friedman does. And in particular, he argues that the reason why the, there are barriers to entry is because it helps raise the wages of the people existing in the industry and actually ends up lowering the quality of care, even though it's justified by trying to keep the quality of care higher. Um, that almost all the benefits that come from licensure that you know, are genuine could be served just by certification, in which the government says these are good doctors and these are bad. Uh, but you're legally allowed to go to the bad doctors, and that um, medicine should therefore be open to free practice because this is really serving the interests of the producers rather than of the consumers, um, and that other systems that restrict entry are too likely to be politically manipulated. <coughs> okay, so now I want to go through in a little bit more detail how Friedman makes his argument. So, um, uh, Eric, do you want to give us a little... Uh, without looking at the slides, outline of uh, like ha what what are the steps to Friedman's argument? Um, well, basically, he analyzes. Uh, well, he starts by just commenting that like oh, occupations throughout history have been like often restricted by society. Yep. Politically. Um, and then he talks about like different kinds of like licensure and certification and registration. 